Today we're going to be diving into the lives of King Saul and King David. And there's, I mean, way too much stuff going on and it can't all be covered in 20 minutes or so. So please do continue in your daily Bible reading, watching the Bible Project videos. They were going to explain 1st and 2nd Samuel far better than I can. But the story in 1st and 2nd Samuel is a transition story from the Israelites from this tribal confederation ruled by judges into a united monarchy ruled by a single king. The lives of both Saul and David are told with both their rises and their falls. And Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 writes about the Exodus, but it's, it's true of the whole of the Old Testament as well. These things have become typological figures for us so that we should not lust after evil things as indeed those men lusted. Uh, the Old Testament stories are there for us to learn from. We can see ourselves within the characters. They act as mirrors for our souls so that we can see our own failings and our own need for God. Will we trust in our own power like Saul does? Or will we trust in the promises of God like David? Uh, when we do disobey the commands of God, as we all do, how do we react? Well, like David, we recognise our own wrongdoing and ask God's forgiveness. Or will we be like Saul? In 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 6 to 9, we read, But when they said, then give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him, Listen to all the people are saying to you. It's not you they've rejected, but they have rejected me as their king, as they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you now. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what a king who will reign over them will claim as his right. So God goes on to warn them what the kings go on to exploit people. Their sons are going to have to serve in the army of the king. They will plant seeds and he's the one who's going to eat and harvest them. That He's going to tax them heavily, taking away their vineyards, their food and their belongings. It will be as if they are his slaves. And yet the people hear all this and then they reply in verses 19 to 22. But the people refuse to listen to Samuel. Said, no, we want a king to rule over us. Then we will be like all the other nations with a king to lead us and to go out before us and to fight our battles. And when Samuel heard all the people said, he repeated it before the Lord, and the Lord answered, listen to them and give them a king. So this tribal confederation dwelling in the hills and the mountains, in the highlands of Judea, and spread across the land of Israel, they want to be just like the other nations around them. The cities around them, they're not big cities at this time. They're more like what we would call villages almost. Jerusalem at this time probably had a population of between 500 and a thousand people these are not major population centers but God said in verse 7 to Samuel it is not you they've rejected but they've rejected me as their king and by wanting a human king who would bring exploitation high taxes war glory the tribes are rejecting God himself as their king they want worldly power but in so doing, a ceasing to be a unique and set apart people that God can use. In Psalm 146, verses 3 and 4, we're told, Do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. When their spirits depart, they return to the ground. But on the very day their plans come to nothing. Blessed are those whose help is the God of Israel, the God of Jacob whose hope is the Lord their God. So throughout the scriptures, we're warned again and again of putting trust in princes, in kings or emperors or rulers, rather than the God of Israel. We see today how we can so easily be distracted by putting our faith in princes. Uh, in America, evangelicals spend a huge amount of money on trying to get the right people in power, rather than focusing on living as Jesus would want them to live. A recent survey in the US found that Christians thought of themselves as compassionate, loving 
and respectful, whilst non-Christians thought of Christians as hypocritical, judgmental, self-righteous. There's a disconnect there. And whilst on earth we're strangers and exiles, our citizenship is in heaven, our king is Jesus, our fellow citizens are found in every country, all over the world, in every nation. In Jeremiah 29 verse 7 we're told, seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you to exile. Pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. And that's the attitude that each one of us are called to have to the nations of the earth. We want the nation that we happen to be born into or the nation that we currently live in to do well, to be a blessing. We want it to um, have that welfare, that general wellness. But we must not forget our primary citizenship is in heaven. Like Israel, we're called not to place our trust in princes and let us not reject God by placing our hopes in human kings, in presidents, in prime ministers like the other nations. Laws can enforce penalties, but only the gospel and only the spirit can change hearts. Saul is the first king of Israel. And in 1 Samuel chapter 9, verses 1 to 2, we read, There was a Benjamite, a man of standing, whose name was Kish, son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Bekorath, the son of Aphanah of Benjamin. Kish had a, a son named Saul. He was as handsome as a young man could be found anywhere in Israel, and he was a head taller than anyone else. So the first thing that we should note is the tribe that Saul comes from. He's a Benjamite. And at the end of the book of Judges, we're told a very nasty story about the Benjamites, where a Levite's concubine is gang raped and then murdered, leading to a war between the Benjamites and the other Israelite tribes. And it leaves the Benjamites devastated. And Saul is from that tribe. He's described also as being a head taller than anyone else, invoking perhaps in the reader something of a giant about him. He looks impressive. He's handsome to look upon. But what is his heart like? Saul is a king the people ask for and that God provides, but he has some serious character flaws. He's dishonest. He's prideful. He lacks integrity. Uh, in 1 Samuel 13, Saul and his army are waiting for Samuel to arrive to offer a sacrifice before going to war. And Samuel has not yet come. The soldiers are getting anxious. And so Saul offered a sacrifice himself and in so doing he shows his impatience and self-reliance rather we can trust God he's wanted to take matters into his own hands that would lead to his own downfall how often can we be tempted to do likewise rather than trust God we can be tempted to take matters into our own hands was Saul just like uh, a wise steward of his resources I mean the men in the story get very anxious and they're going to start walking away so Saul says I'm going to offer the sacrifice so they don't leave or is Saul lacking courage here because he's lacking the courage to follow God and wait for Samuel Abraham likewise he impregnates his wife's servant in order to try and bring about the child because he thinks God is slow in his promise but Sarah does have a baby and there's now going to be conflict between Isaac and Ishmael as a result. Sometimes the best action is to wait for God to act, to do nothing and just wait for God to act. David knew how to do this, but Saul didn't. And Saul kept taking matters into his own hands. And it always turns out for the worse. And perhaps there's a lesson here for each one of us today, that we must seek God and find out what he wants in our situation rather than forcing our agenda our plan onto the situation. David was only a young shepherd boy when he was anointed as the next king of Israel behind Saul's back and yet it's nearly 15 years between that time that he's anointed as king and when he actually becomes king and in that time he faces the giant Goliath, he's banished by Saul, he hides in the desert in the wilderness with a band of outlaws, he lives on the run, he's forced out of the nation of Israel, uh, he fights many battles, he's tested and just like Joseph was in Egypt. So 
God converts him from a shepherd boy into a king, using these trials and tribulations to do so, to mould and shape and form him into the man that God wants him to be. And David had the opportunity to kill Saul, literally with his trousers down in the back of the cave. And yet, and he could have done so, taken his place as king, and yet he doesn't. He refuses to take matters into his own hands, but rather he trusts in the goodness, the faithfulness, and the promise of God, that he will be king in his time, in the right time, when God has appointed. And in 1 Samuel 18, verse 7, we hear how all the towns of Israel are singing, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. And Saul tries to kill David, and yet David refuses to lay his hands on Saul. And often in life we can be tempted to act like Saul, to look out for our own interests above the interests of others, our own power base, our own influence in those spheres, and destroy any threat that might be to them. And when people wrong us, we wrong them in return. And yet David shows us another way, the way of exile, waiting for the promise to be realised in God's own time, not our time. Saul and Kit was king and David really was a threat to his power base. His attack on David is how any king would react in this situation and it's wise according to the wisdom of the world. But not as God would have it. Saul in, uh, Paul, sorry, in the New Testament, in Romans chapter 12, verse 18 to 20 says, If it's possible as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, and I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. And in doing this, you will heap burning coals upon his head. So though Saul had chased David into the wilderness, tried assassinating him, exiling him out of Israel, when David heard that Saul had been killed, he says in 2 Samuel chapter 1, verses 23-25, Saul and Jonathan, in life they were loved and admired, and in death they were not departed. They were swifter than eagles, stronger than lions. Daughters of Israel, weep for Saul, who clothed you in scarlet and finery, who adorned your garments with ornaments of gold. How the mighty have fallen in battle. We're told that David weeps at Saul's death. And even though Saul had tried to kill him, he now would become king. In Psalm 62, verse 1, David says, I wait quietly before God, for my victory comes from him. And in the scriptures, the word for waiting is often translated as trusting. All of us face times when we have to wait for God to appear, and that means trusting that he will. There is a concept in Jewish thought called tzizum, or tzizum. It's the idea that God is infinitely the endless ocean, uh, all that exists. And so in order for something else to exist other than God, he had to restrict himself in some ways or create an empty vacuum within himself, as it were, so that other things could exist, so that he could form the universe and all of creation. And Sism gives rise to that paradox of God's divine presence that is everywhere, causing each one of us to exist, but also the absence of vacuum within creation so that other things can exist, things other than God. And this is often our own experience of God, that he is the one who is causing us moment by moment to exist, to the fact that if he stopped, causing us to exist, then we would just cease to exist. And yet at the same time, often we feel God's presence isn't there. We feel only his absence. And this is a moment where we learn to wait upon God, to trust him and his word. In Hebrews eleven nineteen, we read, Abraham reasoned that if Isaac had died, God was able to bring him back to life again. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. So friends, Abraham had faith in the resurrection, that God could bring the dead back to life. Paul writes in Romans chapter 4, 17, Abraham believed in a God who brings the dead back to life, who creates new things out of nothing. That's the faith of Abraham, to believe in the resurrection, 
To be a resurrection people is to believe that God will bring good out of evil, life out of death, that spring will always follow winter. In Psalm 105 verse 19 we read, Until the time came to fulfil his dreams, the Lord tested Joseph's character. And this is our experience in life as well, that it is a test that God is moulding us, shaping us, transforming us into his image as revealed in Jesus Christ. And I might know that some of us, I might know what some of you are facing right now, but I might not know what all of you are facing right now. But God knows what you are facing. And friends, just as David had to face giants, banishments, loss of friendships, exile, life on the run, so each one of us will face our own wilderness experiences, our own dark nights of the soul. And these times are an important part of our spiritual growth. And you might be growing through such a time right now. In the Song of Songs, verse, chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, we read, All night long in my bed I looked for the one my heart loves. I looked for him but did not find him. I will get up now and go into the city, through its streets and squares. I will search for the one that my heart loves. So I looked for him but did not find him. And that might be how you're feeling right now, that you're looking for God but you, you just can't find him. And dark nights are often a time when God is doing a stripping away work within our lives, when he's allowing us to feel stuck, frustrated, um, so that we might let go of our idols and the things that we're clinging to so that we can press onwards in our quest for union with him. And times when we feel most distant from God are often the times when he's doing his greatest work in our lives. The times when we feel stuck are the times when we're actually sliding forward it's like um the footprints poem isn't it you know when the the gentleman says you know where were you when there's only one set of footprints because you know i didn't feel you i felt only your absence that you weren't with me you were gone um but it, the reply is that in those moments i was carrying you um that is often in those moments when we feel the absence of god that actually his greatest presence is there when we can feel stuck, we can think, I'm not growing spiritually, something must be wrong. When actually, this might be the moment where we are growing, but it's a dark night that we're entering. And those are essential parts of our spiritual growth. Discontent is God's way of us being stirred to seek him more in the quiet of our own hearts. And each of us are responsible for our own spiritual growth. The church isn't responsible for your spiritual growth the pastor isn't responsible for your spiritual growth the elders aren't responsible each of us are responsible for ourselves for our own relationship with god and each of us will one day stand before jesus and give an account of our lives our words our deeds our thoughts our actions and these are the ones that we're responsible for in Acts 17 verse 31 we read he is set today on which he's going to judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he's designated, having provided proof to everyone by raising him from the dead. The one who is raised from the dead is the one who will judge the world. And if you feel that you're stuck and if you're not growing, then I would recommend the book Mansions of the Heart, Exploring Seven Stages of Spiritual Growth by R. Thomas Ashbrook. In that book, you'll be able to identify what stage of spiritual growth that you're in, what the enemy's schemes might be in that stage and what you need to do in order to start growing out of that stage of your walk with God. That is Mansions of the Heart, Exploring the Seven Stages of Spiritual Growth by R. Thomas Ashbrook. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verses 17 to 18 writes, Now the Lord is a spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is present, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled faces, reflecting the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, which is the, from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So, friends, this is our calling in life, is to reflect the glory of the Lord into the world, the light of Christ into the world, that we are those mirrors that are reflecting his light, and that we might be transformed from one degree of glory to another into fully the image of Christ, who is the perfect image of God. So throughout this life, David, despite his abuse of power, 
and sin is a man who trusted God and waited on him to act rather than press forward with his own agenda. And even when his own son Absalom rebelled against him, David fled Jerusalem. He grieved when the news came to him about the uprising and usurping son had died. David was a man who cried over the deaths of his enemies rather than rejoiced. And in Psalm 63 verse 6, David writes of his wilderness exile. On my bed I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. So those he, he's abandoned, he's hunted, he's frightened, he's alone. David turns to meditating upon God during the night time. He remembers God and he thinks about him. So in conclusion, friends, let us just take these two characters and place them up as mirrors to our own souls. Do we act like Saul? Are we proud? How well do we deal with the dark side within each one of us? Like David, do we trust God through the wilderness? Do we hope in God despite the human evil around us? Do we trust that God will oppose the proud and raise up the humble? And when that dark, long night comes, do we despair or do we press on to know God more? Each of us does have that experience of the winter, but spring is coming. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just come before you, not trusting in our own righteousness or in our own goodness, but in the goodness of Christ and his faithfulness for us, Lord. And we pray, Lord, help us not to trust in princes, but to trust in Christ, our one true King. But also, Lord, we pray that we would see ourselves in Saul and David and that you would bring conviction and guidance by the Holy Spirit now to shape us and move us towards the good. Amen.